with a uh, brain exercise, a brain body exercise. Can everyone just stand up? Yes. Uh, everyone just stand up? Yes. <laughs> I always love brain, ex brain body exercises because I think they really get you up and, and you know, start doing stuff. So it's a very simple exercise, very, very simple exercise. Uh, I want you all to put up your hands, both hands straight up like that. Right, straight up. Everyone? No, no one has any difficulty doing this, right? Okay, everyone has done it. Take your right hand, your right hand, lift it up. And what I want you to do is take this right hand and bring it over to your other hand, right? And what you do is you close it like this. You hold it together, right? So you hold your hands. Okay? And once you hold the hands, I want to count to three and I want you to bring it towards your chest and I want you to untangle what you just think did. So like this. One, just look at me. One, two, three. <laughs> Should we do that? Are you all stuck? <laughs> I untangle it. Can you untangle yours? No? Try again. So hand, right hand. Bring over, grab. Okay? One, two, three. <laughs> Good job? Oh, you're still stuck. Okay. Some of you are still stuck. So, anyone saw what I did? And what you and you don't realize why you were stuck? No? This is actually quite a quite a, a, a trick that I learned from one of the musicians before. Most people what they do is that they will do this here. And then you'll take the easy way, which is oh, okay. turning this way. So when you turn your hand and put it this way, you're always stuck. You're always stuck. Don't try breaking your hand because you'll always be doing this. So what I did was this. I take my right hand, I put it here. I turn my hand, this hand, out. Yes. Mm. And here. So what I did was I simply just turn it like this. When I, when I turn it in, I just turn it my hand. That's really easy. Why not? Okay, thank you very much. You can sit down now. Everyone woke up early? Yes, great. So let me just talk, talk about some of the stuff here. Um, I have uh, quite a number of, of uh, videos, not a lot of slides, but I just wanted to share with you, uh, you know, a little bit about the brain and how it visualizes and how we actually visualize it. So I'm going to share with you some case studies that are outside uh, our stuff also. Yes? Uh, no, uh, the slides itself. Yeah, start the slides I will run back to the because it's not in the room there. Okay, as it, as it lifts this, I don't know if any of you seen our, our booth just outside. Okay, let, let, let's talk about this in a while. So brain training and mental fitness, a visual insights. So what is, what, what is it that I want to show today? Um, I just want to show you very quickly about the brain. mentioned something, it says 100 million neurons. Mm. Actually, we, the scientists have always been saying about 100 million neurons, but recently we have found that it's only 86 million, 86 million neurons. Mm. Does that mean that we are any dumber? It doesn't mean we are dumber, right? Mm. It's just that we were able to, able to quantify it recently. Um, and what, what the, this, uh, I know, the, the next speaker, I think the last speaker is actually uh, uh, wearing, uh, he's wearing actually a necro you know, the, the, the two, uh, the cat ears out there. That is what we call a brain computing interface, a PCI. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about and how some people actually use the brain waves to create art. So, one of the examples here I want to talk about is turning brain waves into knitted patterns. So, what they did was they, they got the people to sit down and to think about a particular kind of uh, you know, uh, um, emotion. They also played music for them and they actually recorded their brain waves. So what they took was the brain waves and they, and they actually printed it into a knitted form and it became a nice scarf. 
So it's actually your own brainwave that you actually are wearing in this case. Right? It's very unique, it's a unique gift. The other thing is I want to talk about is, is, is this. Imagine that you can, I mean, all of us can see color, right? All of us can see color. But what if one day you can't see color and you actually see grayscale, right? What would have then happen? I don't know whether you've seen this person before, but this person is actually the first known official cyborg in the world, right? So this gentleman, later I'll talk more about him, uh, Neil, right? Neil, yes. Yes, Neil himself. He, what he did was he was born with a, a cognitive defect, which he could not see color. He does not see color, he only sees grayscale. So imagine in a time where it's just every grayscale. So one of the jokes he always makes is that I can see TV, but the TV I see is always grayscale, right? So what he did was he, he asked one of the doctors and convinced this doctor to actually implant this device in his head. You'll see later on in more detail. And what it does is that it actually reads the uh, color out there and it turns it into a note. So a kind of a musical note. So Neil, that's his name, is the almost is the first official cyborg. This is how his device works. He actually in, implanted in the back of his uh, brain itself. He actually is in there. The doctor remains anonymous till today because no one's gonna say I did it, right? Because it's not a lot of people don't accept this these things. And what he does is like I mentioned, so one color one color will be one note. He actually maps the different colors to different notes. So what do you do when you're able to, to extend your, your sense in this way, right? What's the first thing you would do? You obviously become like an artist, right? You'll be able to see and feel different things. Like for example, on the left where he's holding that portrait itself, he actually mapped the speeches of people. So he had one for Martin Luther King, and he also one, had one for Adolf Hitler. And he would usually typically show both and ask people to choose which one they liked. Typically, people chose the Adolf Hitler one for some mm. reason. Right. Until he told them that it's Adolf Hitler, then they would change their mind. Um, the other thing that he did, I think, was interesting was on this on the right side, which is he took all these award-winning records and he, whatever music that played, he actually mapped it into color and he would actually paint it. Although he cannot see the colors and he sees it as music itself, I mean, in, in terms of notes. So he would then paint all this uh, music or this hot top uh, music pieces into color itself. And there's this thing called synthesia. I don't know whether you know it. Basically, it means that I can see music. There's these two kind of uh, senses that comes together, right? Synthesia, right? I think that's the right pronunciation of it. But what he coined is actually sonochromatism, which is different altogether. Because it's listening uh, to color, literally. So what else did he do? He started to make portraits of people's faces. He went to, the, to you know, celebrities, to people, and he said, OK, why don't I scan your face? and see what kind of sound comes back. So he did it for a lot of people, a lot of celebrities. He did it for <laughs> Prince Charles, he did it for you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of celebrities itself. Right? And each of these persons, if you go Google and find out more, has actually a sound profile itself. Mm. Right? But one of the most important things, or one of the most interesting things that I got from, from this is actually this. He said this, mm. humans are not black or white, they're actually orange. <laughs> based on the color tone itself. He just said, how orange are you? Are you very, very orange? Or are you dark orange? <laughs> so he's actually trying to break that kind of barrier. He's saying, you're not black or white, right? You're you actually just different shades of orange. So the, uh, the, uh, the next thing I want to talk about, um, and in terms of how the brain works, and this is actually talk, going back to the PCI part, the brain computer interface part. Um, and this, this artist, the Shanghai-based artist, Jody Shong, actually wanted to show the power of the mind can trump over the body's limitations. So what did he do? Okay, let me just show you this, this short video. Enjoy it. At 83 million, China has the world's largest population of disabled people. The world's leading acrylic paint supplier, Windsor and Newton, wanted to raise awareness that the disabled deserve recognition and respect too. 16 handicapped people were recruited via social media to participate. First, they chose their paint colors. Then the colors were placed in balloons equipped with tiny detonators. Large canvas panels surrounded these balloons on all sides. By concentrating hard, 
electronic signals from their brains were captured and sent to a neurosky processing unit that triggered the detonators, which resulted in wonderfully abstract paintings. that the capacity of the human spirit is unlimited, even though it may be trapped within a disabled body. The Mind Art Exhibition toured 22 cities around China, with an average of 50,000 visitors per week. Some of the paintings were auctioned and earned over 800,000 RMB, which went to help disabled charities. The Mind Art Project exploded on TV stations, national press, and social media. Many opinion leaders retweeted and made it a big topic across China, finally reaching nearly 20 million media impressions for free. A happy side outcome was that the brand awareness of Winsor & Newton went up 17%. So we don't have such a setup today, obviously, right? We don't have anything exploding and doing art and everything. Um, tomorrow, in fact, we will actually bring in this app itself. Today, it's unfortunately not there. Uh, if you go to the other exhibit on the other side, what we have is a, a kind of a special kind of selfie app. You look at it, the app itself, right? And you look, you point it as like a selfie. You basically position yourself right in the middle of this camera. And when you put on the headband, which we have there for you to test, we actually will read your brain waves in, uh, in terms of the different frequencies. So the different colors are the different frequencies, starting from 0 0.5 hertz all the way up to 100 hertz. And the more you focus, the more the colors will become more vibrant and there will actually be sparks coming out of your head. So some people have been commenting, hey, this looks very, you know, makes you look very holy, but yeah, you can try it and you see whether you look very holy, but yeah. Different, we, we were trying it with different people and, and different people had really different results in terms of the, of the shapes and everything. So if you ever got a chance in the next few days, you know, you know come down and, and, and give it a try. If not, you can always stop by the booth and you know, try out the games that we have. So switching gears in terms of um, focusing on mental health, I think that this is a very important topic that I want to talk about. This is Jack. Jack is actually a typical uh, you know, retiree. He just retired from, you know, from doing his work for the last 50 years. And he's very happy at home. He has lunch with his, his uh, family right? very, very often itself. But sometimes Jack actually has a problem. And Jack would then you know, scream and, and just say, hey, why didn't you feed me my lunch? But his family member just gave lunch to him. He would just forget. I mean, this, these are you know, things that are happening more and more often. It's actually not uncommon anymore. Right? There's actually going to be a crisis very, very soon. And the, um, the, the caregivers of this kind of dementia patients are actually three times more stressed than normal caregivers. And this is a, actually a study that was done in Singapore itself, and I think also in the UK. This is actually very true because some people with dementia itself, they're very healthy bodily, right, in body-wise. So they can last another 20, 30 years, no problems. It's not like cancer, right, or something else where you can, you know, last maybe, hopefully, some, some years. Some people last longer, of course. So the key thing is that we are trying to create technology that can help people live happier and healthier minds, uh, and lives itself using neurotechnology and gamification. So I think the biggest uh, challenge here is really after 20, you know, when we're late 20s. How many of you are after late 20s like myself? I'm sure most of you are, right? That's when our minds start to decline, unfortunately. So our best years are behind us. So I think that the key thing here is this. There will be a steady decline. It won't be that sharp. But the key thing is after that, right? Mm -hmm. The key area here. Whoops, sorry. And the key area here. So how do you actually then, um, you know, enhance your lifestyle? How do you actually enhance that particular part where you are actually connectively okay, what you need to do is, you, of course, you need to do, you need to be stimulated. You need to come and attend talks, give talks, <laughs> come for conferences, sign up for membership, with, you know, with science center, whatever, just to make sure that you're always stimulated, right? Don't always stay at home and just don't do anything, right? But I think one of the biggest challenges today is really there's going to be a local crisis. Oops, I don't know why it's so sensitive. There's actually today or last year itself, one in nine Singaporeans over the age of 65 actually has dementia. 
And in 2030, that's 14 years from now, one in five. That's actually quite a lot, 186% increase. That's just local uh, challenge. Global challenge is even scarier. We spent $818 billion last year just on healthcare for dementia. By 2030, it's going to be $2 trillion. Mm. Right? That's, that's crazy. And in 2050, it's going to be higher. So what can we do about it? That's the question. So I would say that in recent years, we have been very, very inter uh, interesting in terms of, or interested in terms of the research itself. In 2013 itself, um, in this uni University of uh, UCSF, um, Dr. Ellen Gazzali actually released this uh, groundbreaking uh, research. He's shown that older seniors, or, or people who are you know, advanced of age, when they train their brains, their effects can actually last more than six months after the training itself. So, sorry, why did it keep moving? And one of the key things is this, they were actually using a full cap EEG, they were actually concentrating on the screen, and they were actually driving this uh, racer itself. So when they focus, this drive, this race, uh, this car will actually move. If they lose focus, this car will actually stop or, or slow down. So what we found was, after the training itself, the, the, this older uh, seniors can actually be uh, better than 20 year olds that are untrained. And this lasts more than six months. The another, another research that actually, uh, I would say that's very groundbreaking is actually now being uh, held. Yes, last year was actually the two year mark. You actually have 83% uh, uh, in the knowledge itself, of, uh, the size of uh, this uh, age of 60 to 77 year old. They found that they actually improved by 83% in terms of executive functions and processing speed. Too fast, I don't know why it's happening. So I'll just skip this. Um, and so what's, what is the, the key technology that we're talking about here that could help? One of the biggest things is that uh, we need to be able to measure how the brain is actually being re reacting today. Mm -hmm. So without some sort of measurement, right, you can't be able to know whether you're actually working out or not. Oh, okay, my slides are going wonky. Um, so you must have uh, the game element and you must have uh, like a thermometer device, something that actually reads your brain wave and does not send anything or any signals in there. The biggest challenge here is uh, the early detection. Mm. You can go through screening, doctors, diagnosis and care, but if people are very afraid to go and see doctors in the first place, how do you then catch this early? You can't. There is a, there is a lot of stigma everywhere, I think globally in the world, especially in Asia, where people say, oh, you want me to go and see doctor because you, know, you think I'm you know, getting old or I'm getting dementia? No, 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 I, I will not go. So there's a lot of stigma there, and people tend to, to, you know, to fight, fight it off. I'm just getting old, you know, it's just part and process of everything. But that could actually be you know, a, a sign of actually early deep cognitive decline. So there is actually a gap there. And what, what we, we propose that it should be done is that you should always start off with an assessment, have a plan of how you can actually train, play some games or do some activities that can help you, oops, and basically track the, the whole thing overall. And then basically be able to track how your brain actually reads uh, in terms of, of, of uh, in terms of the attention as well as how it relaxes or your mental workload, that means how much you're actually thinking itself. And then be able to track this over time, daily, monthly, or weekly basis. So some of the games, um, actually when you go over to the booth, you can actually try out, uh, are designed to be everyday kind of games. They will be like, who's who, your names and faces. I, I'm sure everyone faces problem. I, I definitely do too. I meet all of you today. I will not be able to remember all your names and faces. But though these are some things that uh, you know, are very day-to-day -day kind of life things. Then there's something called Supreme Shopper. I give you money in your wallet, how can you spend that money correctly, right? If you have $54.60, how do you spend it correctly, optimize it over, overall? And then of course, one of the things called uh, looking at uh, all, all these cognitive different functions. So, oops, too fast. These are the five cognitive functions that we the, the target, memory, decision, cognitive, flexibility, visual, spatial, and attention. This is one example of a game. Some of you might have tried it just now. One of the sushi disappears, you need to remember which sushi disappears. Very simple, right? <laughs> very, very simple, right? Tofu disappears, you just remember. But it gets hard when there are two sushi plates disappearing, and then three sushi plates disappearing, and then four. This other game called Psychic Cyclist, you need to focus using your mind, using the pen, and when you focus, the boy will start cycling. Right? If you lose focus, the boy will stop cycling. Mm. Right? You can test it out. So one of the, the key things about the neural uh, learning metrics is this. You must be able to understand how your brain is actually being worked up and plus your game score, right? So when you start out, you're here, you move here, and then this is the best part because this is where uh, you know, you're most holistic. You're using the most brain and you're, you, your score is high. But when you become robotic, that's because, that's because you're becoming too good at the game 
you should not play the game anymore. You should go on to something else. So in terms of what, who can use this, um, you know, all the, all the consumer side, and of course the enterprise side, so like hospitals, different uh, enterprises, as well as these uh, um, you know, enrichment centers. So today, uh, we, we have already launched this uh, consumer version. There will be enterprise versions, and there will be other apps, because this is like, you know, just like what uh, uh, this uh, NeuroSky device is. It is a, a kind of thermometer. There are different apps that you can put on it. So some for visualization, some for you know, anti-stress in different, different areas, right? And it also can be part of telemedicine. I think this is really the future for, for, for us in healthcare. How do you not be able to, every time everything goes wrong, go see a doctor, flood the hospitals, but you can actually do this at home, right? Since, since like, uh, you know, we have, whoops, why so fast? Since we have uh, thermometers and everything in the house, why can't we have something that actually measures your brain, right? Mm. So we work very closely with ASTAR to actually come up with this technology. Um, and we have game developers in different areas. We're doing a lot of events that you've seen even now. Uh, you know, we work and we've covered the media a lot. I think the key area that people like about us is because there's a before and after effect in terms of how different all these things are. Um, and of course, we continuously work, work for partners and, and, and work the, with the community itself. Um, I want to show you this, this last video here. Let me show you whether you can just play this. <laughs> In case you all don't know what Pokemon Go is. showcasing it in the public because we're going to post this up on our social media site soon. We haven't done it yet. Um, I asked the team, I said, hey, can you compile all this research that's out there about health and Pokemon Go? <laughs> it cannot be just everything bad, right? Like, oh, it, it causes a, you know, like a traffic accident here, you know, it gets people, you know, to, to be so addicted that they forget how to eat and go to sleep and whatever, right? So there's always a bad part of technology and there's always a good part of technology. So we've compiled all the, the, the you know, research that's being done in terms of how it can actually benefit. And I think after reading all the articles and all the different things that are out there, I can summarize it to this so that I can save you time so you don't have to go and dig in. When you ever play Pokemon Go or any equivalent kind of game, you have to not just look at your screen. You have to look and admire what the, you know, the, the environment itself. Because that was part of the key research it says that if you don't look at the at your you know, environment and admire whatever is out there and as you walk, you're losing the benefits of playing such a game. You're just blindly looking at the screen and just walking, just like you know, texting or whatever. So that totally uh, you know counters all the benefits of Pokemon Go and getting out of, of your chair or your sofa. Um, I just want to show you one last video because I just added it into the into the um, in the thumb drive. I think in the previous uh, speaker, he talked about whether pets can actually communicate to us. Um, there was a company that actually tried this. Uh, I don't know how successful they are now, but I think this is something that will come in the future. And I just wanted to share with you so that you can have an appreciation of it. Sorry. I'll let the technical guy help. Let's copy into the desktop. So this this uh, Scandinavian team, what they did was they they thought, hey, why can't my pets talk to me? So 
why don't I put one of my, the brain computing devices on my pad and read this and read the brain waves? Can we up the volume for this? Yeah, I think it's just the back. Yeah, I think it updated it. Dog to tell you what he's hmm? thinking. Do you really want to know what he's thinking? Sure you do. Level 15 web content specialist here in Green has more on this new device that claims to translate animal thoughts into human language. Tell us more. It does sound crazy, Fred. Right? No. <laughs> but no more wolf promises to deliver. So let's see what it's all about. Scandinavian designers NSID, which stands for the Nordic Society for Invention and Discovery, designed what's essentially a headset for your dog. Here's how it works. There are small sensors on the top with EEG recorders. It reads the current in the dog's brain. Those frequencies are then picked up by a microcomputer inside the headset and translated into words. The developer, Eric Cauldron, says it's actually very simple. Well, it's really not that complicated as it might seem. It's just the use of existing technologies, but in a new area. The electrodes here are strategically placed around the scalp of the dog. And this has actually been one of the hardest challenges so far. No More Wolf only translates into English right now, and the developers and the entire team say it is a work in progress, so there will be some hiccups along the way. I posted a link with more information on our website. Just check out the find it section on local15tv.com. Karen, you were smiling the entire time the story was going. Why I, so? I wanted. Do they have mini ones for cat? It's like a little mini one. Oh, no, cat. I love her. Uh, <laughs> I'm surprised it's taken so long to come up with something like this. And I wonder, like, what what is the like range of words? Is it I am hungry? Right. Or is it uh, I am mad? Mm -hmm. You know. So if you could ask your cat, if your cat could say one thing to you about the way you take care of her, what would she say? I love you. I'm so grateful. We talked to people who go, we talked to our graphics. Leah Madison that works in our graphics and calling her out right now. She said that if her dog had this, it would follow her around all the time, all the time saying, Mom, Mom, Mommy. Aww. Aww. And she'd give it to him too. She would. I mean, you can't help it. Four news after this. All right, so, so that was actually a technology that they, they, they tried to launch, I think, 2014 itself. Today, I don't know whether it's, it's, it's selling or it's successful itself, but I think they, they, go, they hit a stack because this is very difficult. For the human mind, already it's so difficult, right? What more, a dog or a cat? So I think there will be technology like this coming up so because we need to be able to read the brain waves and be able to learn and do machine learning and say, hey, this kind of thought waves equals to this kind of you know, speech. Whether it's hungry, whether it's sad, whether it's going to be mommy, 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 you know, hungry, 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 whatever it is, we need to be able to map this and need enough data to do this. So with that, I'd like to end my speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for reminding us the importance of brain training and uh, brain fitness and for giving us a very constructive feedback on Pokemon Go. Hmm. So <laughs> we still don't know when it's going to be available in Singapore, right? Yeah. Okay, so we should look forward to that. Um, our next presenter is a catalyst oh, okay. at Team Lab an ultra technologies group made up of specialists in the information society. They create works through experimentation and innovation.